the situation you found, you both found in the house, I mean, did you get the sense that she'd been taken unawares, that this was someone that perhaps she trusted and, or? Yeah, I, I think so. Where, where the murder happened was in the bedroom, which is the very last room of the house. So it's the room where you, you're least likely to bring someone you don't know because you're cornered. Um, my view as well would be, and again, it's just my view, it's on a police theory, it's, it's just my own personal belief, is that she knew the person because why else would you kill her? If it's a, a violent robbery, why go to the extreme of murdering the person unless they can identify you? And that's why we, we've talked about this and practically nothing else for the last three weeks. We just feel it's someone she would have known or someone she could have identified. Ireland, around 20 miles north of Dublin, lies the small village of Knoll. It has a population of just under 400 people and views across the Irish Sea. It's very picturesque. It's rolling hills, lots of farmland. It's very close-knit. There's our cultural centre, uh, we have a pub, a local shop, and that's about it. Um, the village escaped sort of all the development that went on around Ireland during the boom. So it's quite unique in that it's been sort of untouched in the last 50 or 60 years. These people are very close-knit. They're made to feel very welcome in the area, like it's home from home. I drive up and down the road there, and by the time I get to the end of the road, I could have talked to three or four people. You know, it's that type of thing. You pull in and the fellow says, how's it going? What are you here today? And that type of thing. So it is a very close-knit community. Not much happens. Very, very rarely much. The biggest thing that would happen would be a football match on a Sunday morning. It's a very sort of easy-going way of life. The relaxed lifestyle is just one of the reasons that many families make the move out of the city and into the village and the surrounding areas. There's lots of young mums with kids. There was lots of uh, creches and like uh, nurseries for local kids to go to. There are good schools out there as well. And there was uh, some lovely houses to be found up there. One family who'd moved out there were the O'Reillys. Rachel, along with her husband Joe and their two small children, bought their dream home in Knoll in 2003. They quickly settled into village life, but on Monday the 4th of October 2004, their idyllic lifestyle was shattered forever. Rachel had failed to pick up her youngest son from nursery. It was totally out of character, and her husband Joe, who was working over 20 miles away in Dublin, called her parents to find out if they'd heard from her. So I said, no, she hadn't seen her. And then he said he was ringing her mobile and he was ringing the house phone, but he still couldn't contact her. We got worried then. And I was saying to myself, that's strange, um, that Rachel hasn't contacted Joe and that. And the more I thought about the situation, I start to get worried. And I said to Jim, I'm going to go out. And Jim thought I was overreacting. He said, just give it a chance. And I said, no. I said, I just have a funny feeling. Worried that she may have been involved in an accident, Rose drove straight to Rachel's home. I saw her car in the driveway. I sort of had a sense of relief. And I said, thank God, you know, the car is here. And yet, there was no sign of her. She didn't come out. The back door was wide open, and Rosa's sense of unease was growing. Rachel! The contents of a few drawers had been dumped out Rachel? on the floor. And I went into the front room. Rachel! And the videos and that, they were all sort of in a heap on the floor, as if somebody had dumped them out. As I walked down the hall... Rachel! I was still calling her name. Rich. And I pushed Rich. open the door. Rachel was lying on the floor, and my dying day, I'll never forget the sight that, that met me. The blood was... It was up the walls and on the ceiling, and it was all across the hall. And in the bath, there was even blood spatter in the bathroom. Words couldn't describe it. It was horrific. When I knelt down and felt her, I knew she was dead. Rose was in shock, but she knew she had to call for help. 
I was trying to ring the police, and I know now I was like someone mad. I wasn't making sense. And I kept saying, please, my daughter has been murdered. Will you get an ambulance? And the man, I kept saying, I think she has been murdered, she's dead. Will you, will you send the ambulance? But then I rang my son, and I remember Declan lifting the phone. And I remember saying to me, ma'am, and he sounded so chirpy. And he said, well, did you, did you contact Rachel? Did you get in touch with her? And I said, Ray, I said, Declan, Rachel is dead. She was in an awful state when we contacted one another, so um, I said to one of my sons, Paul, come on, we're going straight down. So we drove down as fast as we could. But before Jim or even the police reached the house, Rachel's husband, Joe, arrived on the scene. Joe was coming in and I thought to myself, I can't let him come in here with the two children. He ran in, and I remember his first words to her were, Rachel, what have you done? What did you do? And I remember thinking to myself, what does he mean, what did Rachel do? She's been murdered. She's 30-year-old Rachel was adopted by Rose and Jim Kalali when she was just eight months old. I remember when we went in to see her the first time, she just seemed to take to Jim. She put her two arms up to Jim from the word go. Before Rachel came to us, we had two boys first. From the first day, she was full of life, up the chimney, everywhere. Nothing could hold her down. She was just completely different, you know, more adventurous and everything than the two boys put together. I didn't know what hit me. She was a wonderful little thing, beautiful looking girl to look at and that, and uh, happy as Larry. The great memories of her. She lovely white blondy hair and that, and blue eyes. Along with Rachel, Rose and Jim adopted four other children, and they were all very close. Rachel was a very sporty girl, very bubbly. A fine big girl. She was um, almost six foot tall. She used to do most of the repairs in the house and she'd do all the decorating. And she would have a go at anything, you know. She was a real do it yourself person. Well, Rachel lived life to the full and she was very, very, very happy being a mother. But their lively daughter was now lying dead on her bedroom floor. And when the police arrived on the scene, they confirmed Rose's initial fears. They had little doubt that this was a murder, bearing in mind the injuries which were visible on the, the body. But who had murdered this young mother with such brutality and why? It was early afternoon in the picturesque village of Knoll in County Dublin in Ireland, and the body of 30-year-old Rachel O'Reilly had just been found by her mother, Rose. News broke that a young woman and a mother of two had been killed. I think it came out fairly immediately that the murder had been particularly brutal. It was just a massive shock that something like that could happen in a sort of sleepy rural village. Because they didn't know was there a madman on the loose or what was going on. You know, we were close-knit and everyone was looking at one another saying, who done that? Rachel, her husband Joe, and their young sons had only recently moved into the area, but she was already well known. Rachel had made friends very quickly when she went in. She was an Avon lady and she sold Tupperware. So um, her big thing when she uh, moved in was uh, the way she made friends was to go around selling and having Tupperware nights and Avon lady nights. She threw a barbecue within weeks of moving in so she could meet all the neighbors. News had spread quickly in this close-knit community and friends and neighbors gathered outside the house. Everybody was in an absolute state of shock. That was the initial reaction that they were all totally shocked by the realization that Rachel had met a violent death. Words couldn't describe it. It was horrific. 
The first thing the police needed to do was to examine the scene and try to figure out exactly what had happened. At a scene like this, the forensic evidence, DNA evidence are absolutely vital and you only get one chance to get them without hopefully a scene having been contaminated. The police quickly established that Rachel had dropped off her young sons at school and nursery before heading back home around 9.30 a.m. Rachel had the keys of her car still in her hand, which led us to believe that she was attacked the minute she entered the house, that she was caught completely unawares. There was somebody lying in wait for her to come in. While the forensic examinations were going on, officers started to interview everyone at the scene. I'll just, just briefly touch on what today. All the pieces have to be pulled together. Every minute has to be accounted for. Every second has to be accounted for. The police took initial statements from Rachel's parents and her brothers, as well as her husband, Joe. He told the guard that when he arrived at the scene that he had gone in, knelt down in the hallway over uh, Rachel's body, that he had tested her body for pulses for sign of life. There were boxes which had been uh, in close proximity to the body. He had thrown them across the hallway into the boy's bedroom. He made an unusual comment at that stage in that he said that I probably have messed it all up on you. Uh, he was referring to the fact that uh, fingerprints, DNA and all that, that uh, it would be rendered useless as a result of what he did. I remember thinking to myself, he shouldn't be doing that. But I couldn't say it to him. I thought to myself, he's in shock. And I just stood there and let him. Joe was asked about his movements that day. Joe said that he had left his home that morning, I think about 5.45. He had driven to a gym in North County, Dublin, where with some friends spent about an hour in the gym, showered and then went to work. Joe worked in marketing at an outdoor advertising company in Dublin. Joe told us that he left the office shortly after 8 o'clock with a work colleague and they both drove to the Broadstone Depot. It's a bus depot in Dublin off the city centre. They stay there for a number of hours supervising the placing of advertisement hoardings on buses. He then left and returned to his headquarters, where he arrived shortly after 12 o'clock. The police immediately contacted Joe's colleague to check his alibi. He told a story, not unlike what Joe told. He said Joe was with him, uh, that they had been doing exactly as Joe had said, inspecting buses, uh, gave a detailed account of what went on. Having checked out all the family stories, the police were now concentrating on discovering how Rachel had been killed and what possible motive anyone could have for attacking her. It was assumed pretty immediately that it was a burglary gone wrong. There had been a spate of burglaries in and around rural areas at that time, um, and there had been, there was and is quite a lot of uh, well-known um, criminal gangs who excel at that kind of crime. I thought it was a robbery and someone attacked her as she put up a fight. Everything goes through your mind, and then your mind goes blank on that, you know. The shock of it all was horrific. Then you don't sleep for weeks, you know. I used to wake up screaming the night time. I used to have nightmares. I think I was shot through. As the police continued their lines of inquiry, a picture was emerging of Rachel's life. They discovered Joe was Rachel's first proper boyfriend after they'd met as teenagers at a local department store and they'd married when she was 23 years old. Rachel wasn't a bit nervous the day she was married. She just enjoyed, I'd say, every minute of it. She was so happy and clowned around. She just had a brilliant day. Thank God for it. I think her cup was full that day, I can honestly say. By the time of her death, Joe and Rachel had been together for 13 years. As a matter of course, the police asked Joe about the current state of their marriage. He was asked, was he involved in an affair with anybody else? And he said no on a number of occasions. But at the very end of the interview, or coming towards the interview, he did concede that uh, he had a lady friend called Nikki but that there was nothing serious in that relationship. And he also said that he didn't want 
his family or friends to become aware of that relationship. Officers discovered that Nikki lived in South Dublin and questioned her the day after Rachel's body had been found. She did admit that she knew him because she was engaged in similar type of business. But in the course of interview, she admitted him that there was a relationship, but that it wasn't serious, more or less what Joe had said. Also on the day after the murder, officers had the results of Rachel's post-mortem. It was basically that she had died from severe battering around the head. It was also suspected based on injuries to her arms that she had to put up some defense against her attacker. The post-mortem established that the murder weapon had been a blunt object. Joe had told the police that a dumbbell was missing, along with other items from the house, which led them to speculate that this could have been used to attack Rachel. They needed to track it down and started to search the areas surrounding the house. Less than half a mile away, they found a bag containing a camcorder and jewellery belonging to Rachel. When the police found the stolen items in, in a little stream, I thought that the burglar might have been disturbed and he was running away and dropped these things so she wouldn't be caught with them or that they would slow him down maybe. And I thought the picture was a mage and that it was broke into. Although they found some of the stolen items, the dumbbell wasn't amongst them. Myself and I think Paul and my son went along the ditches on the road looking for the murder weapon, you know. Yeah, looking, hoping that somebody would be caught for it, you know? That filled the void in your head that you don't know what happened. You sort of clutching at straws at that stage, because you're in total shock. The initial evidence had pointed towards a botched burglary. But after finding the stolen goods, the police began to have doubts. They appeared to be left there to be found rather than being concealed by burglars. From a very early stage, we were satisfied that something wasn't right here. It was only 24 hours since Rachel's body had been found. So if the police didn't think she'd been murdered by a burglar, who had killed her? Other of two, Rachel O'Reilly, had been found brutally murdered in her own home at 2 p.m. on Monday, the 4th of October, 2004. The police believed she'd been killed between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m. They desperately needed witnesses and began to question anyone who might have been in the area. Rachel would have been known in the community. It was a huge shock for, for something like that to happen to one of our own, so to speak. In that area, nothing like that has ever happened before. And when we heard it was a young mother, two kids, just after dropping them to school, very, very unusual. Because like any murders that happen in Dublin, they're normally nine times out of ten gang related. The attack was brutal and bloody, so the police believed that the murderer would have fled the scene covered in blood. The initial investigation dealt with everybody who would have been in the vicinity of that house, anybody who might have passed the house, drove by, walked by, or within a radius of a couple of miles over the crucial period. The police were tracing everybody and anyone that had a record and I think for 20 miles around there, they took in anyone that they had suspicions of. They'd done a massive search. But despite a widespread hunt, they didn't find any witnesses, and there was little to go on at the house either. There was nothing left in the DNA analysis which was of any crucial interest to us. When all the family, friends and uh, people who had been in now the house that day, uh, they were all eliminated. The lack of DNA evidence led the police to draw their own conclusion about who may have murdered Rachel. As the investigation progressed in the first few days, it soon became very evident to us that Rachel was killed by somebody she knew. Less than a week after Rachel's death, the spotlight was falling on the family, but they were oblivious and had started to plan her funeral. They decided to write letters to place in her coffin. We put in the letters there and then, and Joe put in his thing, but I remember we left Joe to the last, you know, if you want to say a few private words from that. One of us went back in or something, and Joe said to the undertaker man, you can put the lid in that now, as if he was talking about a tin box, like, you know. To Jim and Rose, Joe's comments seemed cold and odd. And after Rachel's burial, his behavior continued to puzzle them. After the funeral, you pick up all the cards and that, 
And when it came to the flowers from Joe, there was this little card. And on the card were the stark words, see you later, Joe. No mention of Rachel even on them. No mention of love. It just was bizarre. Nine days after Rachel had been killed, the police finished their examination of the house and gave Joe his keys back. He then invited Rachel's family over because he told them he'd felt comforted by Rachel's presence in the house and he suggested it could help them too. But when they arrived, Joe launched into a graphic description of what exactly he thought happened on that fateful morning. I was saying to myself, how could he know like, I was starting to think to myself, this is not adding up and that's not adding up and that. But you're afraid to take on board because the worst scenario in the world for us would be that it was him. Rose had her suspicions that Joe knew more than he was letting on. Meanwhile, in an attempt to appeal for new witnesses, journalist Jenny Friel interviewed Joe at the home he shared with Rachel. He's a terribly friendly guy. Um, you know, he, he was ner nervous, which you kind of found endearing, actually, a little, because he was clearly kind of um, uh, anxious that he was going to do a good job. Halfway through the interview, Joe asked Jenny if she wanted to see where the murder had taken place. And I remember thinking, did I hear that right? Uh, and I remember having to say, how do you mean, like, where it happened? And he said, I can bring you down to the bedroom where she was killed. Um, so, of course, you're not going to say no. He pointed out the blood splatter. He was able to tell us that the, the beating must have been quite frenzied from where the blood had landed on the walls. How he knew this, I'm not too sure. Honestly, I felt a bit sick. I was remember, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not squeamish at all. And I remember just thinking, this guy's in total shock. I remember thinking he must be completely in shock. Kieran O'Brien was another member of the media who was shown the crime scene when he went over to take Joe's picture just 12 days after the murder. I got a, a kitchen chair and I put him sitting in the middle of the kitchen. I said, Joe, you just sit there now and I'll do a few pictures, if that's okay. And Joe then said to me that the police had said that they were treating him as the prime suspect. And I said, do you believe you're the prime suspect? And he said, well, yeah, yeah. And uh, I left, I got into the car, drove away, and I just had to pull the car over. I had never in my life ever, and since then, working on murders and suspicious deaths, I've never experienced anything like that, ever. The case was gaining a lot of media attention, and on the 22nd of October, Joe and Rose were invited to appear on the country's primetime talk show. I was wanting him to say something about loving Rachel, because she was mad about him. The host, Pat Kenny, said to him that night, about your engagement, tell us about that. And he said, well, and he was so blasé about it. He said, it happened on the Eiffel Tower, he said. It was either that or let her throw me off it. And I remember, for some reason, you know, that really jarred with me. Rose had already started having suspicions about Joe's involvement in Rachel's death. It was so hard to try and be normal when you knew what was actually going on. On the Late Late Show appearance, the, the body language between Joe and Rose was, uh, it was very awkward. And then when they cut to Jim in the audience, Jim's face nearly said it all. You know, his, his, his expression on his face was, it really raised questions of what, what the, the real story was. And Joe's demeanor, it was like just, Nothing really happened. It was, you know, he didn't really come across as the grieving husband. His presence on the show led viewers to speculate that all was not as it seemed, and a number even called the police to say that they thought Joe was the killer. But his appearance on screen wasn't the only cause for concern. The night he was on the late late, he said to me, I'd have to nip off as soon as the show was over, the interview, he said, I have to meet him associates coming over from America on business. I thought it was a bit of a cock and bull story at 10 o'clock at night. We discovered at a very early stage that after the show that night that he declined an invitation to stay in a hotel in Dublin or be driven home by uh, taxi from the, the show and instead he went to uh, stay with 
his mistress for the night, which uh, we found a bit odd. Joe had been caught staying at Nicky's house in South Dublin less than three weeks after his wife had been found dead. He'd claimed that Nicky was just a casual fling, but in the weeks following the murder, the police were discovering there was much more to it. A number of phones were taken possession of, including Joe's, uh, Nicky's, also laptops uh, they were taken possession of, and there was invaluable uh, evidence found in all them, downloaded in all them, as to the, what the relationship was. And the press soon got hold of this angle of the story. When that broke, I remember thinking, oh, I was disappointed in him, I suppose. But actually, funnily, when I went back and looked through notes, I remember thinking, you know, he never spoke about how much he loved Rachel or that he was really going to miss her. He spoke about the awfulness of it um, and that, you know, how upset his children had been. But he never personalised anything. The couple and their two sons had just moved into their dream house. And to the outside world, they looked like the perfect family. She taught the world to Joe, definitely, you know. We could see that. Um, no, there was nothing to suspect or anything at those times, you know. Everything seemed grand. But the police discovered that their relationship was far from happy. Joe had been having an affair for six months and often slept in the spare room. But was this a motive for him to kill Rachel? Joe had told the police that he was in Dublin, over 20 miles away, when the murder happened. But the police had been examining all the CCTV footage from the surrounding areas. The CCTV disclosed that there was a, a car similar to Joe's passing by Murphy's Quarry, which is only half a mile from his home, at a crucial time. But it wasn't just Joe's car that was placed there. We were able to put Joe either receiving or making a call at the same time and is binging off the mast at Murphy's Quarry. In earlier statements, Joe had admitted to having his phone with him all day. The evidence was mounting up. And six weeks after Rachel's brutal death, they made three arrests. On the 16th of November, uh, Joe's uh, girlfriend, Nikki, she was arrested for the offence of withholding information in relation to the murder of Rachel. Also arrested were Joe's work colleague who gave him his alibi, and then the following day, Joe himself. When Joe's colleague was interviewed about when they were at the bus station, he admitted he wasn't entirely sure about the exact timings. Joe's mistress, Nikki, also changed her story. Nikki accepted that she was in a fairly uh, passionate relationship with Joe. She didn't know very much about the murder, she says, but uh, she did admit that, and she admitted that um, she had denied that previously because she'd been asked to do so by Joe. Rachel's family were sure this was the end of the investigation. I thought, God, this is great, they must have him, you know? It was a great relief, but then after, I think two days or something, he was let out. Although the police had CCTV footage of a car similar to Joe's in the area at the time of the murder, it didn't show the number plate, and his mobile phone signal appearing to bounce off the mast close to his home wasn't enough to make charges stick. They needed more concrete evidence against Joe, and having already released Nicky and his work colleague without charge, they had no choice but to release Joe too. For the family, knowing that Rachel's killer was still out there was unbearable. They were sure it was Joe and began to wonder about the letter he'd placed in Rachel's coffin. The more I thought about it, I said he might have wrote something in that letter that he knew no one would be seeing. Time was slipping by and I rang the police and I said, there could be vital information, I said. It was the family's last hope. And following this new information, the police took an unusual step. An exhumation order was applied for. That was granted. And on the 8th of March, 2005, Rachel's body was exhumed. Uh, the coffin was opened and a number of items were removed from the coffin. All the letters were forensically examined. The contents of the letter, which was written by Joe to Rachel, went along the lines of, uh, this is the hardest letter I've ever had to write. For only reasons, you and I know, Rachel. Forgive me, Rachel. Two words, one sentence, I'll say them forever. Although this made the family more convinced Joe was guilty, for the police it didn't prove anything. 
With no witnesses and no murder weapon, they knew to make charges against Joe Stand, they'd have to rely on technical evidence, like CCTV footage. One of the problems we had was that all we were getting was side views of traffic on the road, so we had to get uh, it enhanced as much as possible, and that took time. For Rachel's family, the wait was agonising. Every time the phone would ring, we'd think it would be the police with news to say that, that he was taken in and that. I don't only think Joe murdered Rachel, I know he murdered her. And when you're that positive about something, as all you want is justice. The police were sure of his guilt too, but they had to prove it. And placing his phone at the crime scene was crucial. They knew that it had bounced off a phone mast close to his house around the time of the murder, but they had to show that this wasn't just a coincidence. We must go to prove where the phone was likely to be at that given time. We had to be sure, we had to be certain, because this type of evidence, uh, to my knowledge, had never been used before and had never been relied on before to such a degree that we were going to rely on it. We were companies in Sweden, we were dealing with companies in England, and all these things take time. The police had to be certain that they could prove Joe's phone could only be within a short radius of the phone masts. It was frustrating because there was delays and which we had no control over. Uh, other agencies had control over. They were doing their best. Uh, there was a slow process involved. But at last, on the 19th of October 2006, just over two years after Rachel's murder, the officers finally had enough solid evidence against Joe to charge him. For her family, it was time to face the reality of what had happened. Nothing that you could ever imagine would have come near what the truth was. It was unbelievable. Rachel O'Reilly was brutally murdered in her home on the 4th of October 2004. The police suspected very early on that her husband Joe had killed her. But it had taken two years and eight months to bring the case to court. People wondered why it had taken so long. And people were very curious about the evidence that they had gathered. There had been speculation about mobile phone records. There had been speculation about the, the murder weapon. But nothing had been confirmed. Joe pleaded not guilty, and it was the first time the family had seen him since he'd been charged eight months earlier. He walked in with a swagger. You'd think he was the head chief justice, you know, and he used to walk in every day like that, and he'd have a <clears throat> a briefcase or a roll of papers under his arm as if he was going to conduct the trial. Like, he, um, he had a fierce arrogance about himself. I didn't want to look at him, and I couldn't help it. He looked so detached from everything. I remember coming into the court building, and he was sitting on a bench outside with his mum, and um, across the, the hall were Rachel's family, and... Um, it, it's just such an odd experience to watch two families who were obviously at one point so close. Joe O'Reilly said that he couldn't have killed Rachel because he was working 20 miles away in Dublin at the time. It was now up to the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Rachel had been killed by her husband. They produced emails and texts that had been sent between Joe and his mistress, Nikki, which showed that although they'd been planning a life together, Joe had concerns about breaking up his family. The two boys were very, very important to Joe, and one of the fears Joe had was by uh, taking up a life with Nicky, that he would lose uh, possession of the two boys, if you like, and he said he felt that he might get a divorce and that he, wanted to be, he would effectively become a weakened dad, which didn't appeal to him at all. What also came to light was that four months before Rachel's death, someone had anonymously tipped off social services, suggesting Rachel was an unfit mother. The claims were proved to be unfounded, and in court, emails about the incident between Joe and his sister Anne were read out. Anne, in pretty colourful language, had asked Joe how they, you know, how Rachel, calling her several expletives, had got out of this one. And Joe sent back a pretty curse-ridden email himself saying that social services had behaved pretty much how he expected them to and that it had confirmed his suspicions that if he was to go after custody, it wouldn't happen. Anne also mentioned in the email back that uh, Rachel had been planning a surprise dinner for him 
and uh, he sent back a really heartless um, reply about how it would be the last thing on earth he would ever do, go to dinner with that whatever. Um, and there was some kind of formula he put, uh, Rachel and me and marriage over forever. You, Evidence showed that Joe was unhappy and wanted out of the marriage. But was this enough for him to kill Rachel? The prosecution laid out their version of what happened on the day she died. They alleged that Joe left the house at 20 to 6. Having left the house, he drove to a gym in North County Dublin, which was an usual enough uh, occurrence for Joe. Uh, he drove to the gym with a couple of comrades there. They spent some time in the gym, had a shower and left then to go to work, where he arrived just after 8 o'clock. He then told a colleague that he'd meet him at the bus depot in Broadstone. But rather than driving there, the prosecution alleged that he drove back home. He basically laid in wait for Rachel to come home. The thinking is, is that he possibly shouted to her from the bedroom, causing her to go down and meet him in the bedroom, which is where he beat her to death. It's believed he then went in and took a shower and washed all blood off him. It's thought he put a wash on for all his clothes and the towels that were used. It was alleged that then Joe staged the house to look like a break-in. And even placed a bag with some stolen items in it in a stream close by. On his drive back into Dublin at 10.07 a.m., he texted Rachel. The content of that was that Joe hoped that Rachel and the two boys had slept well, that everything was OK, and the significance of that call was that it pinged off one of the masks not far from his home. The prosecution alleged that this cynical attempt to cover his tracks actually placed him close to the crime scene. They said he then went back to the bus depot, saw the colleague who was to provide his alibi, and then returned to his office around 12. One of the office staff saw him arrive. She noticed that he was very red in the face, that he appeared to have been crying, and that he looked terrible. He just looked terrible. Uh, she made this comment to him, and he made a remark, uh, something along the lines of, oh, Jesus, and he returned to his office and went into his office and stayed there. Joe waited in his office until he got the call to say that Rachel hadn't collected one of their sons. Playing the concerned husband, he called around her family and friends, but instead of rushing straight home, he calmly headed out to pick up the children. The schoolmaster gave evidence in court that Joe was hanging around the yard, walking around, wasting time, like, you know, just hanging around. He had a pair of sunglasses on. The prosecution alleged that Joe was wasting time because he wanted to be sure that someone else found the body. The police hadn't found a murder weapon, although it was thought to have been the dumbbell Joe reported stolen from the house. Without it or any witnesses, the prosecution relied on groundbreaking technical evidence, which tracked Joe's movements throughout the day via his mobile phone, which he'd already admitted to having on him at all times. They had PowerPoint presentations, um, you know, showing a map of the route that was taken from the house back down to into the city centre and all the various masts. The experts then pinpointed every single mobile phone mast that a signal would have pinged off whenever Joe made or received a call or text during his journey that morning. I think there were two in particular. Um, there's a mast in the quarry that's only less than, I think, a mile away from the home. There was a signal picked up there at about 25 past nine and um, uh, one that was on the road back to the back to his office again, which is when he had said that he was in the bus station. So he had lied about where he was. Um, and he was actually placed at the house when Rachel was murdered. It was the first time in the Republic of Ireland that mobile triangulation data had been so heavily relied on in court at a murder trial. But it wasn't the only technical evidence that needed to be convincing. 
CCTV footage showing Joe's car going past the local quarry before and after Rachel's murder had been enhanced, but it still didn't show the number plate. So the officers went to extreme measures to prove it could only be Joe's car. We tracked down the number of cars like Joe's, which were in the country and which were a small number at the time. And all them uh, owners and drivers were interviewed and eliminated as being in that area on the date in question. The case was headline news, and everyone had their own opinion. It was 50-50. No one could be sure whether he was going to be found guilty or not. You know, there were people who thought that he shouldn't have been, given how circumstantial the evidence was. But as the case went on, I thought he was going down like all the time. But then another day, something would crop up, and you say, oh, my God, you know, this town is spanner in the works of that, you know. Joe didn't take the stand and relied on his alibi, that he'd been working in Dublin over 20 miles away with a colleague. But when his colleague was questioned, he admitted his timings could be out by 40 minutes or so, which would have given Joe enough time to murder Rachel. In total, the jury listened to evidence from over 104 witnesses. The court case was a harrowing experience, four weeks. And I think that took more out of us than anything. It's only until afterwards you realise it's a knife edge because it can go one way or another. Finally, on the 21st of July, 2007, the jury came to a decision. It's a guilty fact. Because we were thrilled, but... Um... You realise the enormity of it that he did. Like, it brings harm to it, he did more, dry, you know? Well, you just feel this sense of relief, you know, thank God, because you just feel it would have been... I don't know what I would have done had it been not been a guilty verdict. Joe O'Reilly was sentenced to life imprisonment, which in Ireland is around 15 years. The case attracted a lot of attention, not just locally, but across the whole nation. There were stories of how people announced at their wedding reception the verdict. There were stories about people who were on holidays, like news filtered down to the pool where people were, were like sunbathing, and there were cheers when it came out that he'd been found guilty. Like, that's how big it was. I think because it read like the, the plot of a movie, you know, he meticulously planned everything, and he thought he was going to get away with it. He really did. And even today, Joe is still maintaining his innocence. He has appealed twice unsuccessfully, but there's nothing to stop him trying again to get the verdict overturned. Joe might have got a conviction and he might be in jail, but we're also serving a life sentence. I think it's very, very, very unfair that they can keep appealing and when does it end? And for us, it's just horrific. You know, and it just seems so bizarre that a convicted murderer, and I feel if they go once and it, you know, they're turned down and they go twice and it's turned down, that should be it. You know, why torture everybody? Because it is a torture. It's almost a decade since Rachel O'Reilly's brutal murder. And for the residents of the quiet village of Knoll, life has never been the same. It's funny, when, when you mention Nall or Nall Village to people, the first thing they remember it by now is the murder. I don't think the area will ever recover. It will always be known as the area where Rachel O'Reilly was murdered. Since this crime has happened, the, everyone's got more close-knit and more watchful and they're keeping an eye on everyone. And for her family, they'll never forget their beautiful daughter. When I think about Rachel, her death and her awful death doesn't really define Rachel. I'd love her to be remembered as this bubbly person that we had for such a short time that touched everybody's hearts. They would all remember as a fun loving, sporty girl, and a great mother, and a great family girl. I suppose we're lucky we can look back on the good times. It all came to an end very quick. I wish I could go back. I'd give anything to be able to hold her, even just for one minute. 
And it's things like that that you miss.